Hello, it's Heiser Agostino, and this is the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 285. 285. I'm not going to say that in German because obviously I don't know it, but if you're wondering what that language is prior to me actually divulging it, it was German. Because guess why? The background's changed, right? I'm like all those YouTubers that do that thing. Oh, the background's changed. It means I'm away from my house. <laughs> no. Okay, the background's changed because I'm on holiday, but as a good hard-working content creator that I am, as just the hard-working individual that I am, I've decided to carry on and do a couple podcasts whilst I'm here. One one pre the whole, you know, Berlin madness and one post. So you can see just how much this city ends up kind of uh, crumbling every fibre of my being into some kind of fine powder dust. Not that tapas, not techno tapas dust, just the other kind of dust. You know, the kind of the stuff that comes off a, off a construction site. You know what I mean, isn't it? Yeah, anyway... <laughs> Hope you guys are well. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling amazing. Just hopped off the plane. I've still got all that Ryanair soot all over me. I'm covered in all of it, I think, somehow or the other. But it doesn't matter. I'm here, live and direct from the BR. What's the shorthand for Berlin? Is it B E R? B R E? B L N? B R E? Or B L N? Who cares? I'm in Berlin, live and direct, coming at you now via the interwebs. As per usual, if you're watching this via YouTube and you like what you see, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment, right? Done though. If you're listening via the podcast app, five-star review, share with your friends. Easy things. I'm not asking you for money. I'm not asking you to send me, I don't know, coins or to transfer into my account and send me your mother's maiden name or give me the name of your last pet. None of that stuff. Just smash the like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment, share with your friends. That's it. Minor. Low brow interaction, low brow. Anyway, apart from that, what else I've been up to? I've still got a soot all over me. I've got a glass here of whiskey and OJ because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm celebrating the life of Wiz Khalifa right now. I've got a little warm bottle of Berliner Kind here that I bought from the uh, River River. I've even pronounced it the supermarket in Berlin. And a few others in the back there, as you can see, that are gonna get consumed later on tonight when I meet my the rest of my friends. But for now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah. So I'm gonna do a bit of um, what am I doing in Berlin? If you're wondering, actually, let me just update you on that one. So I come to Berlin quite often, as you are well aware, having uh, tuned into this lovely podcast. I am a very big fan of club culture, very big fan of dance culture, very big fan of DJing, very big fan of electronic music, and um, most of the best places to go and experience those said things is none other than Berlin. I think probably London comes a close second. Or we're probably tied with Amsterdam, maybe. I don't know. I would say. I don't know what you guys think. Or maybe another city in the UK. Or maybe some of you more experienced clubbers out there would probably say a place like Georgia. Um, maybe Ukraine. Maybe Moscow. I heard the scene there's pretty cool. Uh, maybe Poland. Krakow. I heard it's popping as well now. There's loads of spots popping up. And obviously in Portugal, Lisbon, Porto, there's stuff happening there too. Um, but for me, in terms of just... Um, an all-encompassing experience somewhere where you can go and see a whole variety variety of DJs, not variety of sounds maybe it's only probably <coughs> sorry it's only maybe slight i'd put against berlin it's that it's quite it's, it's all samey right there's not many different sounds uh, out there for the most part it's all different kind of djs approaching it in a different way which is also a challenge right because mostly it's also mostly techno everywhere here prides itself on being like the home of, it's price it's, it's basically the home of techno right so, um, uh, second only to maybe Detroit, uh, which is obviously the birthplace of techno. But in terms of just what techno culture has kind of to has kind of uh, formed into nowadays with you know techno tourism, like me, how's I'm a victim of it? I would say Berlin is the best example of it. But on one hand, you would say it's probably a good thing that they just concentrate on techno because it means if you're like a I don't know a bar DJ around here, like a lower level DJ, you're gonna have to be at a really good level to keep pace with everyone else that's gonna be you're competing with, right? So I'm assuming their local DJs in Berlin must be insanely good because everyone else is really good. That's how it usually happens, right? Iron sharpens iron. But then on the same token, I also think for a club goer, there also must be a bit of fatigue when you go out. Like you've you've seen how many more uh Ben Clock type sets do you need to see from like some random dude or girl you don't know? Probably not, you know, you probably can't tapped out once you've done it once already. So there might be that is plays a part in it. But overall, I think if you want to come somewhere where uh, I've already got, I wish I'd bring my allergy tablets, man. That's the, like, you look outside, right? It's really cold. It's not, it's not that warm. But then for some reason, my science is always flare up. Maybe it's the altitude as well. I might ha um, add to it as well. And I'm guessing drinking these sugary drinks isn't going to help either. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Uh. 
Yeah, as I mentioned, I think in terms of just an all-in package deal, if you want to come here and see a bit of culture, because I always say to my friends, I think a few of my friends were a bit worried about coming here and they don't want to get lost in the source, right? That's a common thing that happens to people that come to Berlin. You come to Berlin, you get a little bit, you know, because they're, they're very lax when it comes to the drugs and the drinking, you know, for the most part. You're allowed to drink out on the street and open. You know, if you're if you're an American, you'll probably be like, "What the fuck?" Yeah, and there's no carrying around stuff like this in like paper bags. No one gives a shit. Just drink on the street. Obviously, don't be a dick. There's also a bit more of there's a bit more um, uh, politeness and awareness of the people around you. Like I, I've I've rarely, if ever, I've never seen a fight since I've been in Berlin. Never. And I'm sure if if you've been in most metropolitan cities around Europe or even some places in America, you can't go a week without seeing somebody. You know either get into a shouting match or actually physically assaulting each other so that kind of helps uh but i always tell my friends who are worried about coming that even though you can get lost in the source you can come here and just kind of go go crazy and you know do everything and go see everything and touch everyone you can also come here and just have a real cool sightseeing trip there's loads of cool uh places to go and visit uh you can go and visit loads of cool art galleries. They have loads of them around here. Obviously, you got to pay for them. So, like in London, where most of them are free, so you got to pay for quite a few of them. You can see, uh, you can see, but yeah, loads of art galleries, loads of cool cultural points. There's the shopping here is not too bad either. There's great vintage shopping. The vintage shopping is probably some of the best you've probably seen in the world, really. I think, especially the kilo stuff that you can get. You kind of go to a shop where you you can put fill stuff in, fill stuff up to a kilo or put stuff into a basket and they weigh in and you pay for that usually the stuff is fairly priced because basically in berlin for the most part people get by mostly by buying secondhand clothes there are there is a small contingent of people who are into fashion but for the most part people don't really dress to impress in berlin they just dress to kind of you know express their individuality so there's loads of mad shit you'll find in vintage shops just coming and, it, and i'm guessing maybe because germany's landlocked they get stuff coming from all over the place, right? Really cool stuff that pops into their charity shops and vintage shops. So there's never a shortage of wild finds you'll be able to get from Berlin. Um, and yeah, loads of stuff in between as well. Oh, the food seems really good. It's been popping up for a while. I think if you've watched any of the Munchies videos from the last few years, you would have seen a, a, a bit more of an extensive uh, look at what Berlin does in terms of the food. One blog actually that I really like that's a good option of it. It's this blog called... Uh, I think it's called Berlin Berlin Food Stories. Actually, they've got an Instagram. Actually, that's really cool. I'll show you that. Uh, let me yeah, let me get it up on here. Berlin Food Stories. It's a really cool little Instagram page that kind of you know highlights some of the best places to go out and eat in Berlin. And yeah, those things are popping up all over the place. And there's a real good appreciation for like the Turkish culture here because you know I think Turkey basically Turkish people make up the highest um, the largest majority of immigrants I think for the most part in Berlin. Um, the cuisine they have like if you've been to a kebab shop in London and you think you've you know you've done all the kebabs in the world. And you think you've aced it, you think you know what you're talking about, you need to come to London. I mean, you need to come to Berlin for sure. The kebabs here are just in another level. Or the kebabish or the kebab stores or the Turkish restaurants are just in another level. You get people that cook stuff that's region specific. You get people that cook stuff that's from a certain area or a certain time period. It's just insane the level of the attention and care that goes in. Just like um, imagine your local uh top kebab in like dawson right and they're just cooking like michelin star level food every night for like drunk partners like me and you it's insane to see um so this is the website i'm talking about uh, i'll put it up on here on the screen for you guys to see if you're watching via the youtubes so this is it berlin food stories right it's a cool little blog this guy runs it um and he goes around reviewing all these cool places in berlin to go eat at and the instagram page is pretty popping too because he highlights loads of places as well shares the videos and clips on there and again i think it gives you a good, different idea of what berlin is about and i'm sure sure this guy's a dad and he's got kids and stuff so he's able to kind of have a pretty cool experience being in berlin so i'm sure for those of you that aren't into techno and don't give a shit about electronic music and don't want to do drugs and don't want to drink you can also come to berlin and just you know pig out on some amazing burgers and you know asian food noodles all that stuff obviously the standard curry works um but loads of cool stuff you can find when you're in berlin and i rec really recommend coming because um, again it's a cheap holiday uh it's not far the, the the flight i took this morning was what an hour and a half if that getting into the city center where i am now i'm near uh well i'm not gonna say where i'm near but anyway i'm i'm, I'm in a city center somewhere and it takes like i don't know 40 minutes on the public transport 20 minutes on the on an uber you pay like 20 euros pretty cool pretty calm isn't it so yeah that's what i'm doing i'm here specifically to go to Bergheim on sunday of course church 
Ah. I'm gonna go Bergheim on Sunday. That should be flipping amazing. Let me actually see what people are up to at Bergheim now because I always like to check the Bergheim location on Instagram. It's a very underrated thing, actually. I'm not sure people use it as much as I do, but if you're going to a new city and you don't know what, and you want to check out a certain thing, like, you know, I think the, the routine before that I used to do, uh, or my workflow prior to kind of find out what was the real vibe of a place was to go on TripAdvisor and go on, like, the newest r- reviews. Sometimes when you, when you search for a place on TripAdvisor, it usually gives you the most recommended reviews or average reviews, or whatever. But if you want to really get the heart of it, click newest and it will sort all the ones that people literally went there the other day and they'll give you the real news. But nowadays, I tend to go on Instagram and just search the location. Like, if it's been geotagged, uh, you can search for it on Instagram in a search bar, even on the app or on the, web, on the website, and then it comes up and you can just basically see people's stories that they've up- uploaded, tagging the place, or just the posts that they've made. And then, of course, you can kind of go on there and kind of creep on their, on their caption, read their comments and see what they actually thought of the place. And you can actually get a fair, a, you can get a fair impression, a much fairer impression of where you're going as opposed to reading a Google review or wherever it may be in it. Because I think they're meant to be impartial, but, you know, come on, if someone's paying you to eat at a restaurant, you're not going to say it was shit, are you? So these are some of the top posts. Let's quickly go through some of the Bergheim story people put up. So, yeah, um, I think everyone's come, coming to see the same people. I think Dr. Rubenstein uh, playing on Saturday, uh, Tin Man after in Bergheim. Then you've got Nazir. Can you, can you stop that? Pause there. Nazir, Boris, obviously. Um, Bergheim resident, Marcel Dietman. Uh, Devious One and Neil, so that should be flipping cool. And yeah, people posting pictures of themselves outside of Bergheim. It's pretty, I think it's maybe a bit easier, probably less of a problem to do it outside of the building. Because I always, I don't know, there's part of me that always thought that if you went to Bergheim and you took a picture outside, that somehow the staff in there would see it and kind of take it, take it, you know, make make a note of it so when you came in next time, then, then now you're at the door. But I guess, you know, it's a public space. You can't take a picture inside, obviously, because it's basically a private property, but outside is you're more than welcome to. But I still wouldn't anyway, to be fair. Uh, but yeah, loads of cool pictures, of course. You get to see what the actual building itself looks like. It's going to open later on tonight. Ragazzi, Davide... These two girls probably won't get in. Ragazzi, <laughs> Davide è tornato intero, quasi. Quasi intero, non... Si da Bergain, appunto. Fair play. You got some obvious pictures of people walking around. So yeah, that should be fun. Someone took a video inside. Oh, it's going to go straight away, isn't it? Naughty, naughty, naughty. Yeah, you should, you should do that. You should not do that. But yeah, you do find a few people take pictures of them. Oops, get out of here. People take pictures of themselves inside the club. And usually, if you're quick enough and you spot it, you, you can see a member of the Bergheim team, social media team, like getting into the comments and basically tell them, hey, delete that picture now. If they can't DM them with their private account, they'll probably comment and say, hey, DM them or whatever. And just take it down and you know remove that stuff instantly. So they they, they 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 do they do go they do a good job of policing it, and I think the community does as well. To be honest, we do kind of band around and you know if we see people taking a piss and uh, invading other people's privacy, then you know fuck that shit. Yeah, loads of cool pictures of people hanging around. But yeah, that should be cool. I cannot wait to go. So that's that's happening later on. Uh, Berghain, what else I'm gonna do? See a lot of friends that live here too. During the whole, like, uh, there was a big migration out of London. I think maybe that might have been, what, like, five years ago or five to ten years ago. A lot of, a lot of people left and went to, like, uh, no, so a lot of people left and went outside of London, right? They went to places like, I don't know, Bristol, you know, Brighton, uh, what's that other place called? Hastings, Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds. A lot of people going to Leeds, but there was a few braver souls, especially some of the... Um, how you say them? Especially some of the people who were like maybe a little bit lost in the source in London decided to go to like Berlin to go and rave. I was like, Jesus Christ, you guys are brave. But some of them have done pretty well for themselves. So I'm probably going to be a few of them up later on today. And then that'll be it really. And just, you know, have a dance and stuff. And again, like I've been here a few times, so I don't really get as crazy as I used to in the past. You know, it's not like the biggest deal in the world to me. And obviously, with the older you get as well, it, t- it tends to just turn into like a real good clubbing experience as opposed to like a time for you to like, you know, turn into another Project X event. But, you know, what could you do? It should be fun. I'm looking forward to it regardless. But let's move on. I've got loads of to talk about. Loads of interesting topics I have penciled in here for us to discuss. Um, we're going to go through them in a minute. Let me just quickly blow my notes because, you know, the silences are playing up. Oh Jesus Christ! Oh yeah, that's that's lovely, isn't it? Yeah. 
That's beautiful. But anyway, <laughs> hope you didn't hear that. And if you did, what can you do? So, loads of topics to talk about, loads of things to get into, stuff that I want to speak to you about, mostly concerning street and fashion, and of course, some other topics that I have in there. My hair looks fucking disgusting, but I didn't have time to get a haircut before I left, and obviously, I'm not going to go to... Should I go to... Should I try and find a black barber in Berlin to get a haircut or a fade? Let me know in the comments below. Should I go out the adventure and risk my head looking fucking wild just to get the, the, the sides shaved down a bit? That's all I want. Maybe take down the beard a slightly, or maybe not, because if they, if they touch the beard and they fuck it up, I'll literally scream. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let's see. We'll find out. Anyway, so, topics, 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 topics. Let's go through them. Let's go through them. Let's go through them. So... Number one, be true to your school, Nike Dow. I think I spoke about it before, it? but let me quickly touch upon it again because I think I was rambling prior. So, Nike's going hard in the paint with a dunk thing, isn't it? They're not, they're not fucking around. They really want kids to wear dunks again. And I'm just not convinced. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not convinced. I just don't think it's a thing. I think it's a manufactured uh, resurgence. You know why I think it's manufactured? Because I saw the other day... Uh, you remember that picture of uh, Virgil and Drake walking down the street wearing their matching Arterex jackets, right? From like the, you know, some limited edition one that you can't get. It's like $800 and shit. And then lo and behold, the next day, Virgil Abloh has an Arterex jacket walking down the runway. It's a bit like, ugh. It's a bit, it's a bit, it's a little bit too uh, done up. It's a, sorry, it's a, it's a little bit too contrived, right? Not, none of these collaborations or these like leaks seem like authentic. It's not like he actually, like I'm sure that Terra Certic he's been wearing a couple of times now is going to be part of the off-white collection he's going to be doing, right? Off-white ACG, outdoors, blah, 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 stuff. There's nothing that's organic. It all seems a bit like contrived. So I wouldn't be surprised that whole time that Virgil was wearing dunks, that somebody from Nike actually hit him up and said, hey, man, we want to bring this shoe back and we thought you'd be the best ambassador or influencer for it. Because that would be a quite cool... If you're, if you're someone from Nike, that's a pretty cool marketing uh, technique, campaign, activation, whatever you may call it. Anyway, really, right? To take a retro, especially if you've got a new a, a retro, a newer shoe, I think... Uh, sorry, a retro. If you've got like a newer shoe, something that hasn't been made previously or something that's like a newer shape, then it might be beneficial just to kind of introduce it with somebody standing next to it and kind of posing, right? Um, but if you've got like a Dunk, uh, an Air Max 1, whatever it may be, like something they're just trying to bring back, or maybe not, let's like a Tailwind or something, or something that people have been asking for, like a really good Icarus, like if that got redone, right? Or Nike Trainer 2, or Nike, uh, yeah, those kind of ones, right? You would essentially just seed it out to people who fit, the look of that shoe don't give it to everybody because i think that's what nike used to fuck up before they just seed everybody the same shoes right but let's get do seeding as like specific to the people or specific to the group specific to the kind of seed the subgenre, the culture the interest whatever it may be right or, or just a person right like maybe this person's known for wearing that kind of shoe even without nike endorsing them then you let them wear that shoe and then slightly they start wearing the more rarish colours when they start appearing at like more glitzier events. I don't know, some fucking purple mag award thing, some uh carrying Reutfeld book launch, something, right? All those little trendy stuff, right? Miami Art Basel. And then it'll make more sense. But with this stuff, with the Virgil stuff wearing the dunks, I always thought it, it came across to me from the very beginning that it was like, you know, Nike had their hands in it. And now with this Nike be true to your school coming back again, it's like, oof. Cause to give you some context, I worked at 1948 when these came back out. And I remember how long they sat on the shelves. Like, no one touched these Nike Be True to Your Schools. They, were, they, they did a big campaign for them. If, I'm, if, I, remember, if I remember rightly, they, they did like, some video thing. Was there clothes involved? Not too sure. But it was a big deal. They spent a lot, again, it's Nike. They, they probably, you know, money is not a thing, but they spent a lot of time and money trying to make the Nike Be True to Your School dunk package a thing again. It just didn't work. Now, in this era, I would lend them a little bit of a leaf and say it might work because kids love Air Jordan 1s, right? And Air Jordan 1s look very similar to Nike Dunks. So there could be that kind of lineage, but the person that I'd want to wear this wouldn't be a Virgil. It would be like a Rocky. It would be like a Big Sean. I don't know. You know, those kind of guys that wear those kind of like, you know, that have ripped top jeans and Jordan 1s. I'd want those kind of guys or that E Bravado dude, right? That E Bravado kid that does the custom jeans. I'd want him to wear it. And then possibly, possibly over time it could work. But just to kind of like flood the market with like, I don't know, 
this whole range of colorways of shoes, hoping that it kind of kicks off, it's just a logo. Because let's be honest, the off white dunks only sold because they're off white, right? If they weren't off white and they were on the shelves normally, they would have not sold at all. And I'm a big fan of shoes. I actually like that shoe. I like the design. I like the colorway choices. Um, I like the activation. I like the campaign behind it. But they would have sold anything at all if they weren't off white. So I think they're overestimating the impact that they've had with this campaign. I think they they think it's actually doing well when it probably isn't doing as well as they think it is. Because again, I don't see. I'm out and about. I don't see any kids. The kids that they'd want, right? The the kids, the ones that they sell overpriced, uh, you know, material goods to. None of them wear that stuff, right? They're not wearing it at all. But again, I don't know. Maybe I'm dumb. Maybe I don't know. And again, I, I, I'm just talking from the outside in. I have no info. Uh, I have no kind of industry info. I'm just kind of giving my impression. But I don't know, man. Let's read the article anyway. Nike's iconic Be True to School dunks could be making a comeback in 2020. Uh, during All Star Weekend in Chicago, images of the purportedly forthcoming Surrey Chris and Kentucky dunks hit the web, right? In loads. Cool. Load dunks look so weird, though, isn't it? Especially like those kind of plain colorways, eh? No? Or is it just me? You just want to kind of fill in the white parts with like contrasting colors, I think. I think that's, remember, that's what. I remember uh, this guy, Matt Sleep from uh, Crooked Tongues back in the day, did a really cool custom of a Nike dunk that way, where you kind of had. Whatever colorway it was on the left, you kind of had the inverse on the right foot. It looked fucking good. And that was back in the day when people used to take like Angela's paint, strip down the base and stuff. Remember that, that stuff? Like, oh, that was such a good era of shoes. Anyway, uh, Devin Booker was seen sporting the, Cy- the Sierra Chris Nike Dunks while native Chicago. Uh, Chicago and Don C posted the same white and orange low tops. Several news sites also reported that Booker shared images of the white and blue Kentucky lows. Uh, these two early looks could be the case that Nike is planning to retro the release of the B Tutor School Dunk. So they're going to retro them, but in lows, not in highs. Which is weird, isn't it? I guess because that. Look, again, this dunk thing is bizarre. So they want to reintroduce the dunks, but not the highs. They only want to reintroduce the lows because the lows have an, they have an affinity or association with Nike SB. Nike SB is cool because all the rappers are wearing it, essentially. And they're hoping they can cash in on that. Okay, maybe it might work. Then I'll take it back. Maybe the highs, no. The lows that could work in that respect. So, as part of what the Nike now calls the College Colors Program by Nike, the original Be True to School Dunk pack released in 1985, uh, featuring seven dunks made the Nike sponsored school, the University of Michigan, they learned the listing it all, and brought the pack to a total of eight models. Okay, they had the one more, the Terminator. Imagine being George Town, you have to get a Terminator. Everyone gets a dunk, you get a Terminator. Tell me, it's like, well, it's like the ugly system, isn't it, really? Uh, the pack made greater waves in the world of collectible sneakers. For example, we turned dunk shared the same colorway scheme as our signature black and yellow, and Virgil Reese that also matched, including sorry, Michigan and UNDL colorways. But yeah, I'm just not keen on them. I'm not, I'm not sold. I don't think it's going to work. I think they are barking up the wrong tree, and they're overestimating um, what kids actually want. I think kids are still wearing the same old, same old shit, really, at the moment now. There's not much variety in what they're actually adorning on their feet. And again, maybe I could be wrong, but from what I've seen in the streets, it seems that way. But yeah, Nike v to School Dunks in Lowe's could be coming back. If you're a fan, smash like below. If you're not, smash unlike. <laughs> Probably not going to be good for my ratio, but fuck it. Who cares? Let's go. Next on the list here. What do we have? Coronavirus face mask. Oh no, man. This is deadly. So this article I saw from Dazeem, the leading architectural interior overall design uh, blog that I've been checking out since I went to uni and shit. And they, and they had this guy who uh, made these weird face masks for the, you know, in, in kind of response to the coronavirus. So I'm not sure if he did them as something that was functional or something just to kind of like, you know, as like a kind of, you know, he's, he's an artist, right? So he wants to just, you know, his reaction to what's going on in the world. That's what artists do, right? They react uh, to what's going on around the inner world and also in their personal life and they apply it to sculpture, to art, to photography, to a canvas, to a shoe on someone's foot, to a, a shoe on someone's face, sorry. So I didn't really think that much of it. But I guess in this ultra sensitive world that we live in today, people got offended. And he had to apologise, which is weird, isn't it? I'm not sure why he's apologised before. But anyway, um, so... Max, uh, how do you pronounce that? Max Side Seden Sedentoff Sidentoff Sidentoff. I wonder where that's from. Max Sidentoff apologizes for offensive images caused by coronavirus mask or any items, which is interesting, isn't it? So there's a picture here of this guy wearing an um, Air Max 95 around his face, basically, with the you know, basically, he's got his, his nose and his mouth inside the actual 
uh, bit where you put your foot and then the laces are wrapped around his ears as like sort of like a makeshift mask, right? Obviously not gonna work, it's just you know, whatever. Uh also the designer Max has his quote with that. Has apologizes has apologized for offending people with these photos of homemade coronavirus mask. Oh, this energy. Sorry guys. Jesus Christ. Um adding that his work aims to take people out of their comfort zone. He says, I apologize to everyone that felt offended by the series. It was never my intention. The, the, the Lambian German artist told the zine. Uh, Most of my work takes a critical and often ironical uh, look at our surroundings. It's important for me to take the people out of their comfort zones and to see if it's different. But ultimately, it's up to them to interpret my work as they want to. The series of images called How to Have a Deadly Global Virus triggered angry comments from Disney readers, with many describing the project as insensitive and offensive. Well, that one with the leaf is fucking wild, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a lettuce leaf wrapped around this woman's face with the with the holes cut out and elastic on the top. To be fair, it's quite a creative use of a lettuce. I never I never would have thought I've never seen a lettuce and automatically thought to myself face mask. Right? I thought to myself a garnish for a sandwich, but not face mask. Anyway, um so this is coming to continue here. The series of images called out to the commentator A. Jill described the project as insensitive and misinforming, while Cow Cow said it risk spreading misinformation. Reader 700 did an accounting called the, the part and I an idiotic, insensitive, and dangerous article. Max created the series after seeing online images of people fashion makeshift masks out of household items out of fear of creating it. Okay. So there was there is a thing going on now, I guess in the places where they're unable to get face masks where because they, they, they're sold out and stuff or there's a short supply of them where they are making their own right at home so you probably saw that inspiration and took it one step further so it's interesting you just do what everyone else is doing right and you and you obviously do it to a high level and you do it you know in a professional manner with you know great photography you know backlit room you know, you got that high contrast lens that designers love to use, right? You got a very diverse cast of models. You just copy what everyone's doing in society, and suddenly you're the one that gets pillars for it. Eh, I don't really get that, to be honest. But again, uh, maybe the fact that people are actually dying and it's a global pandemic, as as opposed to just some thing that we heard on social media that was, you know, some kind of bl- blown out of proportion. It's not been blown out of proportion. It's something that we should be aware of and be very cognitive of. So maybe that's you know there is a reason where to apologize. But I just think it's a uh, the apology is so empty. Like, why would you project for you? Okay, you made an art piece of art that people didn't react well to. So be it, innit? Keep it moving. Let them keep, they should keep it moving too. If they don't like what you did, maybe they'll like the next thing that you put out. I don't really know. That's just, uh, I just find that strange. People want him to apologize. Well, what is he apologizing for exactly here? I don't actually get it, but, you know, again, what do I know? Let's move on. What's next here? Uh... Post club, why dealers are leaving the, the clubs behind? What's this little article? It's just from Mixmag, right? I saw this early in the week, I think. I've got a feeling, right? This oranges isn't helping my, my mucus problem here. It's not helping. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure all this um, allergy stuff that I have going on now is probably caused in part because I've had some, I've had some cheese actually, haven't I? I've had some cheese. I've also had this orange juice. So yeah, I don't think it's actually helping, but. We are where we are, innit? We are where we are. So, let's continue here. Uh, let's get this article. There we go. Let's get up on it. So, this is from Mixmag. It says the following. Uh, Mixmag says, post club, why DJs and producers are leaving the nightclubs behind, right? Uh, more and more electronic artists are moving away from the club space. Interesting article. So, here we go. Uh... Read it out loud here for you guys. In 2016, French Canadian producer Marie Davidson made Adieu au Dance Floor. Goodbye, Dance Floor. The straightforward French lyrics set forth her feelings about the club scene. Uh, she speaks of her losing her love, her student losing herself to nightlife, so suffering solitude and anxiety, and even refers to being a uh, line for hell, right? Three years later, in August 2019, she announced that she was going to give up a life all altogether. If you know Brie Davidson, you know her famously for that track, Work. Uh, she's not the first artist to fall out of love with the club. She won't be the last. Post Avicii and with the new welcome transparency around artists' mental health and addiction, many are acutely aware of the mental and physical risk of the typical DJ lifestyle. In a recent piece of Mixed Mike Net, featuring tips from artists on how to stay sober, minimizing time in the venue was suggested as a viable as a valuable sort of technique by people like Secret Sundays, uh, Giles, 
um, if you have to do an in and out of job, don't feel bad. You need to prioritize yourself and promote a Kai from a boat. Don't get to a club at two or three hours before you're set. Get treat as a job. Go in, go out, I'm assuming, right? So, which I agree with, right? But also I think this whole like a uh, wellness thing in dance music culture needs to have an honest look at itself too because for the most part, it is coming from a small minority or small segment of people within the dance music industry who just, who are just caners, right? They were just ex-caners. They got on it too much. They overindulged. Because again, I always freak to myself, especially with the times that I've spun out of control going outside too much, right? I was I always I always think to myself, you know what? Imagine what it must be like being like a world famous touring DJ or producer, and you've got access to all these people. You're in a green room, which is I would imagine probably the worst place to be for a DJ, right? Hanging out there, being suggested to take this, take that, go here, go there. Um, you essentially, you know, are the prize of the room. People want to treat you well and have, they let you have a good experience, so that you can come back. And everything is in everything's lined up for you to have a very messy night. So I think a lot of the people that are having these, having the opposite reaction and saying, like, you know what, electronic music, and again, it might, it might coincide with the fact that electronic music is bigger than it's ever been, right? It's a billion dollar industry, I'd imagine so. Festivals are popping up left, right, and center. Although clubs aren't popping up the same sort of way, festivals are doing that. Uh, new and interesting and younger kids are coming up and making a new sound, uh, creating their own spaces, illegal warehouse raves, their own little... Uh, club nights that they're running catered to a demographic they think is not being addressed or looking after or looked after or provide people with safe spaces so there is uh, also this thing where like it doesn't really get getting bigger these guys and girls who are getting on it from back in the day have now realized that they can survive or get by or have a mortgage or you know have a car have a family just by doing what they love playing music or producing music but they also realize that there comes a point in your career where you have to decide, are you going to be a pro or are you going to be an amateur? How are you going to treat it? Because yes, it's a hobby. Yes, it's something that you enjoy. Yes, it's something that you do in your spare time. But it's also got to a point where people are demanding more of you. They want you to perform in more places in a short time frame uh, for, you know, with maybe little to no kind of like, you know, um, warning or heads up. You're getting booked left, right, and center. You're just getting sent places to buy a manager or buy your agent. Uh, you don't really have time to think about things. So the last thing you need to be when you go to those gigs is drunk or high. You can't be. There's no way you're going to be able to function at a high level doing that. Now, there are some people who exist. I would look at somebody like Larry from, oh, was he from? Uh, Ace of Spades. Uh, well, 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 anyway, you know what I mean, right? Larry, the, Larry from Rock and Roll is one. I'd say uh, Ozzy Osbourne, obviously from Black Sabbath, being the number one. And I'd say for electronic music, probably someone like a Ricardo Villalobos, right? He seems to be, I don't know how old he is now at the moment. He must be approaching his 40s or maybe his mid 40s. And again, maybe it's the way he looks. He doesn't, he's probably not getting on it all the time, but he, you know, he looks like he has a fun. He dabbles and does what he needs to do to have a good night. And he seems to be doing just fine. But I don't think everyone could do that. He, he's, he's been DJing since what? He was like in his teens or whatever. So it's just some people's makeup is just different. Some people need to have that separation of like, okay, I'm going to this play that I like to do. But it's also a job. I need to be of service. Because I always think about that myself. Like, again, and I play, you know, at a very low level compared to people that are talking about this article in bars and pubs and stuff. But now one knows coming to see me. But I'm also very aware that if I am going to be playing in front of these people, I need to not make their night. I need to not intrude on their night, right? Because they didn't know I was going to be there. So I need to be as accommodating and as, no, accommodating. I need to be as complimentary to their night as I can. Obviously, without being a fucking walking jukebox, but you know what I mean. So I think a lot of these people, again, it, it comes from a place of like they did all the drugs and they're not going to do any. But I don't think it's fair to say that everyone should follow this template either because some people, some people can just, you know, have shots, have a line or two, smoke some weed, get drunk, and DJ and still do a good job and go home. So not everyone needs to, like, you know, go to like a meditation retreat and, you know, and renounce going to green rooms. So I don't think it's for everybody. Uh, so, the reason for moving away from the club space is just uh, are just as often artistic, though, especially for those with decades in the game. Jeff Mills has often expressed frustration with the standard nightclub setup. From his improvisational jazz quartet spiral uh, deluxe, sorry, to his orchestra, orchestra, orchestral projects, my word, my words is today, 
He's pioneered a meshing of the classical traditions with the perceived uh, disposability of electronic music that's helped to reveal the depth and artistic street. What does that even mean? There's no point of that thing. What Jeff Mills is doing has nothing to do with like he's tired of club of nightclubs. Just offering another way to present te- electronic music, isn't it? It's all well and good. And Jeff's not the only Detroit originator to step into an orchestra world. Well, Derek May launched an okay, it's an orchestra article anyway, right? At the same time, much of the club scene has changed, in many cases, becoming less a place of expression than consumption, a circuit of DJs and artists, where the emphasis of the ever grander spectacle and production can alienate not only the crowd, but the DJ for the music. But again, that's all a problem of the audience not demanding more. I think the audience has to be a little bit more crude up. I think nowadays, most pun- look, most punters, regardless if, if they're like a 15-year-old girl going to see somebody at fucking i don't know party in a park or you know somebody that's 55 going to houghton or some shit we're quite educated we know what we like we know what we don't like right but we should expect more of the people that we do like we should push them we should make sure that they're not resting on the laurels because i do feel a lot of the problems we have in club culture especially in london or in the uk it mostly stems from people just be ap- apathetic or ap- uh, yeah, ap- yeah apathy right just being a bit bare not a lot bothering i think if we push our club owners and our bar managers and our people that do the bookings of these places to actually, you know, have, I don't mean diverse in terms of like filling a quota lineup. I mean, just a diverse lineup. Like not every week has, not every week in fabric has to be, you know, Craig Richards and Ricardo Vera Lobos. Not that it is, but let's not have that caliber of artists play every single night. And let's have a nights where you do, you don't have a lineup or you just have a lineup full of, you know, local kids, uh, people that are coming up, people that have maybe a couple of records under their uh, under their name, under their belt, do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's the way that you actually build a scene and you get people to appreciate the music in a different sort of way. And then, maybe there could be a point where those DJs also don't see the Ricardos as like the pinnacle. Because again, Ricardo in DJ world is sort of like looking at Messi and thinking, oh, why can't I be like Messi? It doesn't make any sense. But because there's no like grading, because especially again, that's why resident DJs are so important. That's why club clubs need to reinstall, especially in London. Because if you're only looking at the tier A DJ as a point to like reach for, that's like something that you probably want because those guys are established, they've been grandfathered in, they're part of the fabric of you know, no pun intended, of the of the industry. It's very difficult for you to kind of leap from them in that, in that respect. But the more interesting part of it is for you to like see what they've done. And kind of build upon that in your own way. And then be given a platform by the clubs, by the labels, by whatever, to then show what you can do. And then garner new fans, and then they can come into you. And then when they come to you, when you speak an interview, you'll be like, oh yeah, I was a big fan of this guy. And they'll check out that guy. And it kind of it keeps the circle continuing. But I think nowadays, when you just keep promoting the bigger dudes, and then those bigger dudes keep, you know, they keep pushing us to the edge. They get fucked up. They have a mental break. They do too much crash the kids don't see that as a lesson they just see it that oh that guy's a loser they go again it's just it's too much it's too much it's too zero to a hundred there's no like in between right yeah like i, I look at shark the wits a good example did she even play media sides clubs before she blew up like she just went from playing you know not many places to suddenly play everywhere and i say at the same time there's no like that's a problem there's no middle ground there's no like coaching there's no uh ex- trying to extend someone's career and seeing what they can do interesting later on it's just all like now 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 big 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 that's the issue that we have. Uh, many festivals and institutions, institutions sorry, have tried to find a middle ground between the immediacy and physicality of a club culture and the intellectual side of things, pioneered by likes of Sona and Unsound. The risk, of course, is that moving away from the club space and perpetuating the idea of the highbrow institutions like the concert venues and not going to digital matters, dark music, our culture becomes disconnected from its roots. Oh, come on, man. These articles. No, it doesn't. just another option. Like, this. Why does everyone feel so... I, I, imagine having... I don't know how people can think like that, where like everything is one and all. Like, if it's that way, it's this way. If it's this way, it's that way. So, no, some, sometimes having the ability to have... Because there are some... I'm, I'm sure there's a population of people out there who grew up with electronic music, but would never get caught dead walking into the burn right now again, right? Because it just it's just something that was a part of their life once before. Now they've moved on. No, no, no ill will about it, but just they don't want to go there again. But they wouldn't mind hearing techno music reinterpreted in an orchestral way, right? In a different setting, maybe, right? But that's not taken away from everything that the Bergheim are doing, right? Or that Fold's doing. It's just another way to present that music. It's like, it's insane, isn't it? It's like, oh, we should not We should ban all art books because people won't go to galleries. It's like, what are you talking about, man? Uh, but yeah, 
a weird article, but definitely check it out. I think the writer was reaching somewhat to, for that conclusion, but it's interesting nonetheless. It's on Mixed Bag. It's called Post Club. Why DJs and producers are leaving the night like, nightclub. Sorry, but let me hear Not that life. So, next on the list here, what do we have? Uh, yeah, let's end it with some Virgil one. This is interesting, right? <laughs> so, as you're aware, I'm not as you're aware, or maybe you're not aware, but so Virgil got this really cool news, the New York Times op-ed, um, you know, piece put on, put about it or put out about it by a very famous and influential fashion critic and journalist called Vanessa Friedman. I recommend you check out some of the other pieces she's done for New York Times but prior. She's a really good writer, um, very knowledgeable, very witty, and just all around good egg when it comes to posting stuff about the fashions, right? Oh, come on. You said maybe you'll log in. You have to log in to kind of read this shit. It's annoying, these subscription things. Isn't it? Can I just, what have to do? Ay, ay, ay. Continue. What have to do here? Okay. I have to log into this shit. Uh, or your Times? I, 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 I don't have a Times account. I'm going to give you my Facebook. I must be a way to read this without having to do it. Can I do an incognito maybe? Let's see if I can do an incognito because this is annoying. I know I can afford to pay for the paywall stuff, but I don't want to. Okay. That's that's the thing. I know. I'm, I'm a bad person. I apologize. What can I do? Uh, Open. Let's see if I can open this link and see if it works. If I do it. Let's see if I can do it like that in an incognito option. What happens there? Actually, you no. Know let me just load it up normally and see if I can just sign it anyway. I need to read this for you guys. You guys, that's 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 always code for um. That's always YouTuber code for uh, scamming, isn't it? Okay, you guys. When someone when someone someone says you guy you, you know you're gonna get scammed. You know you know a finesse is coming. <sighs> Okay, cool. So, are we here? Can I read it now? You pieces of shit. Come on. Oh, so annoying. It's still not loading. I think maybe I've got so much. T There's nothing else running on my computer at the moment. I don't know why it's it's, it's making that sound. I don't know. Can you, if you can hear the fan from here, isn't it? That's something that a lot of gamers get in it from people. When they're trying to criticize and kind of like riot, rag on some gamer, they'll be like, oh, I can hear the fan from here. Anyway, so here's the article. I've got it. Okay, cool. Thank God. It's on now. Cool. Finally, it's there. It's there. It's ready, ready. So, uh, Melissa Friedman, she wrote this amazing article about Virgil Abloh that's been causing a bit of stir on the old social media, right? But it's interesting because this article is both, um, I wouldn't say insulting, but it doesn't paint Virgil in the best light. And it also kind of pokes fun at the fashion industry, right? The fact that she posed such a simple question, which has a lot of, uh, which has a lot of, there's a lot of uh, reasoning behind it. There's a lot of obvious correlations between Virgil Abloh and Carla. So the headline is, is Virgil Abloh the Carl Lagerfeld for the millennials, right? Or is like the yeah, four millennials. And there's a lot of correlation between the both of them, right? You can make some, you know, there's kind of, there is some similarity, you know, cross, cross, cross disciplinary people, very hardworking. The fact that he's got his own namesake brand and he also works for a house, blah, blah, blah. right? Uh, the fact that he's like, you know, a cultural zeitgeist. The fact that he gives really cool interviews and always these weird sound bites that make no sense really, but maybe make sense later on in the future. There are things that kind of align them to both, right? And obviously, again, the crazy work output he's put out, right? Virgil's been in the game for what, maybe not even 10 years and he's already had the retrospective art exhibition, which was usually something that you would do, I don't know, the 10-year mark, right? Or 20-year mark of your art career or of your practice, right? You'd go and look back and kind of, you know, present an exhibition of a far, of spanning across all the stuff that you've done to essentially show off and kind of like, you know, uh, puff your chest up and say, look, I'm about this life, innit? I, I do the damn thing. So you can see the, the breadth of your work, maybe spot some things that you're speaking about which you, that you were doing since you were in college have now been kind of uh, translated into this collaboration that you've done for this big, you know, fashion company somewhere. So, the article obviously makes sense, but it's interesting to read you read it because it's interesting the reaction. Number one, Virgil wasn't didn't seem like he took it too well, right? When uh, I think uh, Vanessa Freedom was shared it on Twitter first. Let me try to see if I can get up the tweet here. It was a Virgil's tweet. <laughs> he didn't really seem like he actually thought it was a nice article about him for the most part, which you know is fair to say. But it's also an interesting conversation because I think 
if there's if there's ever if there's ever been a person in the fashion industry that's very much caused division and very much been a, a cause of debate is Virgil. Right, but he's also done a lot of really cool things. I think in in total, what's he done? Did he delete his face? His Twitter? No way, really. Where does delete his Twitter? Madness. Or is it my internet's gone down? Maybe it's my internet's gone down. I think my internet's gone down. Is it my internet's gone down? Is it my, is it my, is it my, yeah, my internet's gone down. I think. Oh my god, this is so annoying. Living in another country, going on holiday, you run in to issues. Okay, because I'm in another country, it asked me to do a two factor verification because it doesn't believe it's me that could be in Berlin accessing Twitter on some holiday, which makes sense, really, isn't it? I shouldn't really be on Twitter as accessing holiday, but you know, it is what it is. A telephone number. Okay, I have to enter my telephone number in here. Hopefully, I'm not on screen so no one can see it. Yep, I'm not on screen. Great. Well, it looks really, really, really wet. Boom. Can I be accessed now? Am I on Twitter? Am I allowed? Am I allowed to be on Twitter now? You f n c u n t s. Yes, I am. Okay, cool. So let's get Virgil's tweet up here first and we can continue with the rest of it, right? So what did Virgil say? Let me get up here for you to see. So Virgil, Virgil wasn't happy. Uh, Vanessa Friedman was obviously, you know, poking the bear and causing controversy while she's in Paris smooching and scooching. Uh, which is cool for her, I guess. Um, but yeah, let's 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 kind of go through it and see what we can do. So, um, uh, number one, Virgil never really re responds right ever to anything. He's always really kind of like uh, stoic and very much stew on it. And I've always thought it was quite admirable that he does that because I think there's a lot of stuff that gets said about Virgil, even probably privately in the scene and industry. That's a little bit unfair, some of the criticism that comes that comes his way. I think a lot of it is warranted. I think the way he came into the scene, the way that, you know, the the, the rugby flannels, I'll never forgive, in my humble opinion. I think it was a, an obvious ploy to, you know, latch upon and take advantage of the whole Ian Connor Tumblr era with all the kind of quote-unquote kids plopping up like like Glenn Brown and young Lucas Sabat. And he obviously saw an option, an, uh, an opportunity for him to get himself and, uh, in there and become the de facto kind of big brother. And he used it and exploited it to his gain, really, you know, buying up all the uh, stock of the old rugby tops and print screening them and selling for $500. Look, I've got no problem with buying up the stock and print screening it because, to be honest, I'm a big fan of fashion. So I'm a big fan of streetwear. I'm a big fan of Nigo. I'm a big fan of the old Nowhere store. You know, uh, uh, those OGC guys like J John Takashi, Hiroshi Fujiwara. If you research them and you find out about their story, you'll find out that they used to do the same thing too, right? They'd buy like beefy tees and print their logo on it. Sorry, print their designs on it. Leave the, the hang tags in it. And just touch their logo, their woven tags on top of them. So some old baby Nick tops or t-shirts that you get, you might sometimes get like a dual tag. You get like an AA blank tag and also the tag of baby ape kind of like a nod kind of like a, a weird ironic nod to kind of like the fake uncollaboration so i'm not mad at that right reappropriating champion hoodies and screen your thing on it cool but then sell it in line with where it's come from right you're making you're obviously taking an item that's already been ready made and you're elevating a little bit but let's not say you're elevating a rugby top that high it's not as if you like you know replace the buttons with you know pearl buttons and you know um un unpicked the the side hem and reinforced it a different way or cut off the sleeve like you didn't do nothing to it like at least with the fear of god stuff he took those shirts those vintage band t-shirts and actually reworked them so they fit the way he likes the stuff to be fitting right so it's like drooping a little on the shoulder the neck's a little bit tight it kind of cuts off on the sleeves so you can see his tattoos fair but that's probably because he did nothing so that criticism, I think, is, is warranted. I think the other bits are a little bit out of order, right? And also, there's a little bit of it, a little part of me that's a little bit like, if Virgil wasn't black, right, would he really be getting as much stick as he's getting out at the moment? Because I think it's a little bit OTT, especially when you've got people like, I don't know, who's the guy for St. Laurent now at the moment who, who essentially just sits there and, and copy and paste whatever he, Heidi's done previously in, in his career. And he seems to get no hate whatsoever, right? Uh, I don't know. It's, it doesn't make sense sometimes. It's a bit. It's a little bit OTT. But that being said, he does take any stride. He doesn't really reply. He kind of keeps his keep, keeps his counsel and keeps it moving, which I'm a big admirer of, especially in the in the world that he lives in, because he's always glued to his phone, so he sees everything. He reads every DM. I'm assuming he reads every comment. So he's always on there, trying to get get obviously inspiration and get kind of you know motivation to do the work that he's doing. He's also seeing the negativity. So the fact that he can just continue working is a real credit to him. 
But this is the first article I've seen him kind of respond to or reply to in public. He obviously retweeted his own Instagram or Twitter feed, sorry, specifically. And not Instagram. I think Twitter mostly because I think that's where he's got the least amount of followers or, you know, there's not much engagement there with people as opposed to Instagram and stuff. And then the next tweet, he says the following. Uh, obviously, uh, doing a, a quote to of Vanessa Freeman's tweet about the story. And Virgil says, I'm going to do an academic lecture about this article one day, just figuring out which one. Riffing online is far too low hanging fruit for such an easy and massive case in point. Which, if it, if ever there was a way to like not respond to something like this, would be that way, innit? Because it does make Virgil sound like a bit of a cock. You know, that kind of like big. It, uh, Sammy Ross has a tendency to do this too. Um, and I guess it's maybe just the way he speaks. But there is a tendency, and I don't know if it's like a thing that if it's like a consequence of not feeling like you belong in fashion, because fashion is the worst, right? In terms of trying to get in when you're not somebody that looks like the conventional fashion person. When you come from the places that I come from, the places that they come from, right? And you see what we've seen and how we carry ourselves as men. It can be difficult to navigate that kind of system and also keep counsel and also not act out of pocket, right? I've seen people do some stuff in fashion to people from ends where you'll be like, rah, man, if that ever happened anywhere outside these walls, this person would have got laid out. Do you know what I mean? It's not something that you would do. But obviously in fashion, people take advantage of it because, you know, it's a very coveted industry. The jobs are very hard to come by. It's a, basically, if you get a job in there once, you're, you're basically set up for life. No one's ever going to fire you. So I, I get it. And it's a dream come true for a lot of people. But I also think sometimes when they come into the scene they try too hard you remember Kanye had that period when he was doing the APC stuff with uh with John Tatuo have you pronounced his name when you went to Ellen he had that like weird white voice that he had I think there's there is the, there does come a point in time when they do try and assimilate too much and I guess this is a point in, point in case a case in point with this whole like you know him doing art gallery stuff and uh having these soliloquies about the stuff that he's doing on Instagram. The caption just be a caption, but he turns it into some kind of, you know, paragraph about his work and his practice and shit. I think it's all kind of, it's, it's less so for us and it's more so a way for him to legitimize himself in front of the white audience. Again, that's my opinion. I think so. And I think Samuel Ross has a tendency to do that too, right? When he kind of like speaks, I don't know, in, I, I, I don't know what the language it is sometimes that like he's talking about stuff and it's, you know, you're just looking at an M65, you're like, okay, cool, I guess, right? So, Maybe that's where he he's going wrong in this. But again, maybe he's just got his back up. He's reading the article. He's been like, what the fuck? So he's just kind of responding to the gist. But this is not a great response. It's like, he's going to respond. I'm going to I'm going to do an academic lecture. As if like what? Like just writing it. It's, it's, as if like what Vanessa Freeman wrote was low brow. Because it was just an article she wrote in the New York Times. That's something that she had to like, you know, run through editors, proofread, make sure look. Like, Jeremy, you know I mean? it's just a, it's a very uh, belittling and thing to say, I think, in my opinion. Figuring out which one, riffing on each it's far too low hanging fruit to it. It's like the guy's a the guy can be a bit of a cock. Let's say that. We it, I think that's fair to say. I think even his friends would admit he can be a bit of a cock, which is you know a fair point out. I guess everyone that does a does I think everyone that operates at that kind of genius level, which I would ascribe to him, even though I'm not a fan of his work, I would say the fact that he's able to affect culture and shift things and move the needle and stuff in, that, in the way that he's done it, uh, can he can be attributed to be a genius. You're always going to have a bit of a cunty attitude anyway. It's just, I, I, I don't know, are there many geniuses that exist, especially in the creative industries, who aren't cocks, who don't have a bit of a, you know, if you're not their friend, you won't like them kind of vibe? Because I, I get that from Virgil. All these friends tend to like him, and, you know, they're always there to, like, you know, jack him off on stage when they want to, but everyone else that doesn't know him has always got weird stuff to say about him, which is, Something that's general in all creative people that are like, you know, I could say that about a lot of designers that I know in London who are the same. Everyone around them it loves them. Everyone outside that circle is like, oh, that guy's a dickhead. Which, you know, is what it is. And then, of course, um, he had posted another, you know, just a picture kind of insinuating on what the opening sign would be about him kind of tearing down the industry. I don't know what it was. But anyway, so that was a tweet in, in theory, right? And this is the article itself. Let's read it through. We can kind of pick apart some stuff that well, I think is true and some stuff that is maybe a little bit harsh. So it opens. While Virgil Abloh, founder of Off-White and the, uh, and the menswear designer for Louis Vuitton, is kind, of a, is kind of fashion figure that seems to demand comparison, right? Almost every profile contains one buried somewhere in the text or not so buried. He is Andy Moore of our time, says the Guardian. He is Jeff Koons, editor Stefan uh, Tunchi. Uh, he is often, and where no individual will do, a Renaissance man. While struggling uh, to explain his uh, ubiquity, his seeming sudden bank blanketing of culture, people grasp for someone, anyone, to make sense of its influence. 
Uh, after all, aside from his two fashion day jobs, here is a partial list of the companies and brands with which he has collaborated. Evian, Nike, Vitra, Ikea, Champion, Equinox, Jimmy Choo, uh, Sunglass Hut and McDonald's. He has a list of galleries and museums where his work has been shown and sold. The Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago, Gallery Creo in Paris, Gagosian, the Louvre. He has a de- he is where he DJs, Soca Loco in Ibiza, Jimmy's in Monte Carlo, Coachella, the Sun Club in Glasgow and the Potato Head in Beach Club in Bali. You know what's interesting? He doesn't have there. That's something he didn't boast about. Bergheim. He played Bergheim with Zivi. I don't know why he's not boasting about that one. Maybe it didn't go down too well. Maybe Bergheim don't like when people promote this stuff, but he didn't write Bergheim there. But that's a pretty impressive list of collaborators and of venues he played as a DJ. Like, just if you just did that in a year, you'd be, you'd be happy to retire. The fact that he's still going and has a day job is just insane. Like, again, much like a, cause I watched an interview with Logan Paul the other day on No Jumper, much like Logan Paul, you can't, you might not like what they do. You have to respect the hustle. You have to respect the hustle. They work fucking hard. Like Kevin Hart is the same, isn't it? Kevin Hart works is the same way. They, he works so hard that you just have to respect his hustle. There's no way you can like look at Kevin Hart, say he's corny, he's cheesy. Yes, you don't like his movies. He, he's not funny on stand up. But when it comes to working hard and putting his best foot forward and squeezing every single minute in iota he can out of a day, those guys are no. There's not parallel. And I guess also, you know what? This also shows actually. As much as people like to rag upon Virgil and make uh, make it seem like he's a bad guy, it also shows just how lazy everyone else is in the industry. If this guy could come in, right, off the back of being Kanye West's creative director, Kanye's uh, quote-unquote assistant, uh, the guy behind the scenes doing everyone's designs, if he can come up this quickly, it also shows just how lazy everyone else is. Because, he, you know, yes, he had some advantages, but for the most part, it's all just pure sweat and blood that he's got to, that he's got to. Because if you looked at the people, especially his contemporaries or his people, his peer group, I would argue he might be the least talented, right, out of his peer group. He might be, I would say, as a, as a he doesn't call himself a designer, but as a designer with a capital D, probably the least talented. But can you name anyone else in that group that works harder than this guy? For fuck's sake, he had to go. To, he, he was hospitalized for supposedly, right? Because of how hard he was working. We don't know, you know, it could be other things, who knows? But from what we know so far, he was hosp- hospitalized because for, for this shit. You know, people saying, like, you know, they're really about this life. Like, he's really about this life. Like, he gives a shit about clothes. That much, he goes to hospital for it. So. He has lectured at Rhode Island School of Design and Graduate School in Harvard and Columbia. But all the comparisons that have been posted uh, or posted, sorry, since Ablo landed in Paris Fashion Week six years ago began his viral takeover. Perhaps the one that gets the strongest reaction is the most fashion-centric idea. Virgil Abloh it's a Karl Lagerfeld on the millennial generation I've been saying that for a while said uh, Michael Burt the chief executive of Louis Vuitton of course you've been saying that for a while you fucking hired him you hired Mr. Abloh in 2018 previously chief executive of Fendi working with Mr. Karl Lagerfeld from 2013 to 2012 so you can count his opinion to one side but to pretty much everyone else in fashion it's a blasphemous statement almost every time I suggested it to somebody while cat, uh, uh, chatting catwalk side during the f- most recent fashion season which uh, since uh uh, which since early February has been moving from New York to London to Milan and Paris, they blanched and said, "Oh, please, no! Oh, that's crazy! Is this a joke?" As if you know why? You know why fashion people are all full of fucking shit. Yeah, R.I.P. Karl Lagerfeld, R.I.P. the Great, R.I.P. the Legend, right? God rest the dead, right? But let's not pretend like when Karl Lagerfeld was around, fashion people weren't uh, scoffing at the stuff that he was doing at Chanel and saying that it was tired, it was boring and lacking inspiration and he was polluting the world with his fucking stupid set designs and his controversial uh, poking at the bear at, you know, environmental issues and feminism and shit. Let's not pretend like he was some kind of loved figure towards the end. People hated Karl Lagerfeld. They couldn't wait for him to like, quote unquote, hand it over. You never would. Yeah, because if you read the story about him, is it his mum or his aunt, the dancer who, who would, he basically says that, someone kept asking about him retiring, he said, I think his dancer, mum or aunt, somebody in his life who's a choreographer, essentially died, would rather, no, I think they they, she, they told him he would, they would die, at, they'd rather die at their studio or they died at their studio. So he carries that as part of his kind of framework when it comes to work in fashion. So he was never going to retire anyway, right? He would have had to die, and he died, basically, uh, for this shit, and someone else took over. But let's not pretend as if Karl Lagerfeld is some, like, you know, he did no wrong. He did plenty of wrong. I don't know, you could, the, the, the last five seasons, or uh, maybe even so, Chanel were, like, a blur. They're all the same. What do you remember about them? The sets? The the person that ran on randomly? What do you actually remember about the clothes that was that was changing, that, that changed things, that moved the needle? Come on, man. Let's get out of, get out of here. 
Um, then they said, don't quote me, uh, and made anodyne statements about Mr. Abel's relations with young people. Anyway, perhaps it's too early. For both men, Mr. Lagerfeld died uh, only a year ago. This fashion month at 85-ish. Uh, after more than five decades in fashion, that's a fucking long time, man. The industry is still mourning his loss. Mr. Abloh, 39, has been showing a brand for only six years, which is fucking insane. Let's l- imagine from being like the inception of Off-White to where he is now. Like It's just, again, you might not respect what he does. You might not respect the man, but you got to respect the fucking work, man. The work effort is insane, especially in the creative industry where most people are lazy and don't do shit. Because everyone talks talks a big game everyone's like oh i'm doing this project and so again you're not doing anything you're not doing it you're just talking because i was that person too i know what it's like when you are got all these cool ideas in you but you've got the what's that word called you've got you're suffering from paralysis by analysis and you also not execute you don't ship things you just talk about stuff it's like the person that's always got that cool startup idea that's never launched it launch the damn thing put it out there just ask people for help don't make people sign ndas no one cares about your shitty idea just put it out there put your own money behind it don't wait for investment save up your wage working at that shitty job that you don't like anyway and and then make a business for yourself so you can escape yeah I mean, people don't do that so the fact that you did that in six years just insane that's really 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 commendable uh so Mr. Lagerfeld, uh, design, the designer of Chanel Fendi and his own line, among many other things, is often viewed as the ultimate fashion figure, a one of creative genius whose imagination and intellect uh, could not be contained in a single brand, whose understanding of the art and an atelier was unparalleled. He was above all a professional designer. That's the one thing that's, I think, fucking up Virgil in the fashion space. I think the fact that he can't actually make clothes like objectively, I think if you look at some of the stuff on the runway, like it just looks fucked up. And I'm not too sure if it's because he likes it looking that way or because it just looks fucked. But it, it, it always, you know what it reminds me of? All these clothes that come down the runway remind me of Kanye West's first collection for Yeezy that time in Paris. It just, it, there were some cool ideas there, but it just, it didn't look good, right, to the eye. Because obviously he didn't have a team, the production, the manufacturing. Whereas Virgil doesn't really have that excuse with a new guards group, right? He could go, you know, he's there's essentially like, you know, he essentially uh, has everything in house, but it just doesn't look good as like an idea. If, if he's the one that's steering the ship and he's the one that's sketching out the ideas, the ideas just don't look interesting. They don't look cool. They don't look, not cool. They don't look, they don't look fashion They don't look like they've been designed well. So that's, I think that's the thing that really fucks him up in terms of comparison with Carl Lagerfeld because it's like you can't, you can call Lagerfeld for anything you want, but not a good designer is impossible. Uh, so Ms. Ablo is a man who told the world at Columbia you don't have to be a designer to be a designer he doesn't even call himself a designer he calls himself a maker according to New, York, New Yorker perhaps in acknowledgement of critics myself included who don't think he's particularly great at his day job or that he even cares which is interesting right because there is a part of me that thinks part of Virgil's role as a creative or as a fashion figure in the industry isn't necessarily isn't necessarily to be isn't ne- isn't to be like a uh, john galliano or to be like you know alexander mcqueen god bless the dead i think his role is like more is bigger than that it's like we don't we won't see the impact of virgil abloh until maybe i don't know until he's long gone right because i think having my little my own story of being into fashion right i got into fashion firstly primarily from reading the style magazine uh, little handout, mag- the little kind of magazine that ca- that you get in the Sunday Times. That was the first thing that got me into fashion, and obviously reading uh, British Vogue. And then from reading those magazines and finding out about Matthew Williamson and shit, uh, I then got into fashion, got into researching models and designers and shit. And then so far, and then it obviously led me to go to St. Martin's and study product design, right? I wanted to do fashion at first, but I thought, you know what, let me just go into St. Martin's and just feel the vibe and absorb it that way. But that was that's what got me interested in fashion and when i got into it i was acutely aware that there weren't many people that looked like me right of course when i bumped into oswald, oswald boateng one time in soho i kind of freaked out like, oh my god shit it's you right I had a little quick chat with him it was fucking so super super cool and you obviously got to see that there was a real lack of representation in that way for that kind of voice in fashion especially when you consider you know there's not many i think we could all say like without making it sound you know disgusting but you won't really meet many black boys or people in general who aren't who haven't got like a slight interest in like dressing well or clothes in general so for there to be no real designer out there who's really pushing things forward in fashion uh whether they be male or female whether they be black or white or maybe mostly whether they be black is a real real shame 
Um, and obviously, most of, most of it isn't to do with the industry. It might be a cultural thing where, you know, our families don't really respect that kind of line of work. They don't think it's an honorable job. They want to go to medicine, go, you know, into whatever, into science, whatever it may be. But I think the fact that Virgil has got this job is going to do more for the kids or for the industry, you know, in 10, 20, 30 years than it's going to do it for it now. I think now maybe it's a welcome relief. It's a welcome shakeup. I think a lot of the kids in fashion school need to kind of see that although they don't rate Virgil as a designer and thinking what he does is shit, they also need to see that, hey, look how much, look at the opportunities he's gotten because he's the only one willing to work around the clock and get things turned in quickly. He's the only one that's willing, able, he's really able to kind of join the, what do you call it? The underground and the overground kind of thing, right? Do high and low, right? He's not snotty about collaboration. He's not like, um, what do you call it? He's not cynical. He's an optimistic dude. He seems like a positive guy. Um, he gets on with stuff. You know, he's unproblematic for the most part. Uh, all these things are things that a lot of kids in schools and uni need to kind of see. And also the fact that he kind of, you know, has his own little brand, right? He didn't go out and try and, first of all, become the assistant to Phoebe Philo and shit or work under St. Laurent or all these things, right? These jobs, they just get locked into a company. He went out there and put his money where his mouth is. I'm a good designer. Boom. And did his own thing. And I don't think a lot of people, not, not enough people in the in fashion schools do that, I think, in my opinion. So I think maybe that's a good, he's a good, um, he's a good reaction to that so that they can be like, oh, man, you guys, shit, I can do better than that. Okay, do better then. You know what I mean? That, that's, I think, his role in it. Um, and of course, I think maybe like the technical skills might hinder him somewhat, but I think that impact is probably far greater than all that other shit, in my opinion. Um, he embraces and propagates the idea that fashion, this article continues, is not about clothes, but rather the totals of community and that the uniforms of the various youth and subcultures have a legitimate place in the temple of elite now that could him just be that could just, just that could just be him moving the goalpost because obviously he's not good at one thing so he's going to make sure that you know the other thing he's good at which is fair you know i don't blame him for that there's a suspicion somehow that he is scamming the industry and seeing how far he can exploit his own embarrassing desire his own embarrassing desire for school it's need for visible diversity and it's lust for millions of instagram followers which is true he probably is um exploiting it so far but i think everyone's exploiting it i think everyone needs to find an exploitation point that they can hone into so that they can make money and then they can make money so they can further on their ideas and continue creating. I think that's the only way you have to do it nowadays. And I also think, like, for the Kate he gets for posting online, but who else is willing to do that shit? Like, who else would do that to that level to push? Like, would we see any fashion content online if Virgil wasn't around? If that kind of, in, like, do you remember when street style bloggers were still getting shit for posting their outfits on, online? That used to be, like, a thing that people looked down upon. Now people can't wait for Phil O to like get in front of them so he can take a picture of them from the ground up as they smile walking down wearing their, you know, their color something. They just, you know, like they run into their wardrobe and run out outfit. It's like, get over yourself. Anyway, so let's continue here. Uh, one more. High fashion, after all, is famously white, set in its often old fashioned ways and yet desperate to appeal to a generation of consumers who, in its suspects, have a very different idea of what matters than the current establishment does. Mr. Abloh exploits tantalizingly the promise of all that. People line up for what he's selling, even if it feels like what he's selling is a line, maybe because he is selling a line, which is true, very meta. I like that. Um, maybe it's true because I think that's probably the saddest part about the Virgil thing. I think for all the good he's done, I think a lot of his friends around these, like, especially people that kind of, you know, that's that, that, you know, go out of their way to kind of, you know, get on both knees and suck him off. They never, they never wear his clothes. They're not promoting the stuff that he does. They're not like, again, he's the big, don't get me wrong, he's the big dog. He's got the million followers and shit, but it doesn't, it seems as if like everyone just enjoys his freebies, right? Everyone, everyone wants to get flown out to like an activation or to hang out at a store or go to his show or go to an after party and get a free t-shirt but no one's actually willing to like say on record like his designs are doing this for the industry this the, no one's willing to say that because objectively they all know it's not the truth in it like if they compare what they buy in japan or what they buy from the small boutique in paris to what he does they know it it fails in comparison to it but you know, again, should his friends be his cheerleaders anyway for his design, or should they just be cheerleaders for him as a person, like I am? Because I like it as a what he represents. Don't get me wrong, um, he's cool. Uh, maybe that's what his friends are doing, but I, I think that's where that that's that's the kind of thing that I kind of get a bit bummed out about. If I was him, like ugh, man, do you know what I mean? Like, but again, he probably doesn't care because you know all his friends happen to be like the coolest people in the industry, so it all it, it all comes back around. You know, it's all kind of full circle. Everyone kind of benefits from it. Everyone's explaining, everyone's explaining everybody, but everyone benefits from it. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, this moment of reckoning with the world we have fraught uh, we have wrought is, in, is wrought in politics, sorry, in technology, in society. And in many ways, the idea that 
it may be Mr. Abler who has inherited a blogger for mantle that in, pro, in profile and ambition and reach occupies the same sort of mind and cultural space as the Gen Y and Z consumers and the social media age that can't occupy for those who came before. It's simply a pointed reflection of the choices the industry has made and when it comes to its own value system in place and its consumer mindset, which is true. Maybe the fact that, you know, they spit out and chew the most talented designers to the point that, you know, they commit suicide. And then, you know, what you're left with is what we've got now in the industry. You've got these like weird hybrids, isn't it? Everyone's like a creative director, art director, you know, product person. They're not very much, they're not like the quintessential fashion designer. Back in the day, you'd have a fashion designer who was surrounded by a team of business, marketing, advertising people who were then able to present the work out into the public. Now you have these, you know, everyone has to be multi hyphenate slash slash slash, which no, no, not everyone can do to a high level, by the way. Uh, and then designers who can actually just design and really cut a suit amazingly well, right? Who can fucking, you know, do the fuck out of a hem, right? Who can really make the lining of a suit look as impressive as the outside, right? Who know the proportion between the leg and all this shit. Like, the p designer designers, right? Those people, they're dying by the millions, isn't it? By the, or by the thousands, right? They're not the most sexiest thing out there anymore because they don't know how to hashtag. They don't know what a cool market activation is. They don't have any cool friends, right? That's kind of going by the way. So, again, it's fashion's fault. In, in inferior as well. In pure biography, it continues. In pure biography, the two are, duh, very different. Mr. Lagerfeld was white and German, grew up in a hot house of high culture and elitism in the first half century. And also, maybe it was a reported uh, Nazi. We don't know if that's true. But I'm going to throw that in there. A legend. Escaped to Paris as a teenager and apprenticed among the most historic French houses in Barmaid and Patou uh, before beginning his career at Chloe. Mr. Abloh, a black American, grew up in a suburbs outside of Chicago a child of Ghanaian immigrants studied engineering in college and then architecture at Illinois Institute of College worked with Kanye West for a decade and opened off white in 2013 his former introduction of apprentice apprenticeship sorry consists of six months at Fendi right so it's co complete contrast but again imagine representative of the era right uh, one was born in what the 40s one was born in the 80s I don't know do you know what I mean maybe it's a different era but it does it, it's quite interesting to see that you know he's got like six months at Fendi you know designing leather sweatpants and uh, Karl Lagerfeld was you know interning at Balmain uh, anyway one comes from the one comes from the couture tradition. One built his career on the streetwear. One saw himself as a caretaker of artistic heritage under Mr. Lagerfeld Chanel, acquired a specialty of tillers and embroiders and hat makers and cashmere spinners all to protect them. One has keen awareness of himself as a harbinger of cultural change and a breaker of boundaries. Mr. Ablo is one of the rare black creators and directors of uh, that great talents in the, of France or a French heritage house, which makes his position practically fright uh what fretted and unusual and yet in many ways he may he may uh they may have met in the middle which is kind of where fashion is in these days mr uh, mr burke said abloh is digital like carl cross-generational like carl hard-working like carl intelligent like carl like carl like carl mr burke fucking loves virgil isn't it? no wonder uh mr lagerford is probably putting a lot of zeros in that guy's bonus in the year mr lagerford who dabbled in photography a book publishing and collaborated in the brands that include the H&M and Coke. Ms. Abelow's seemingly voracious desire to put his creative mark on everything and anything, even if the end result seems splash stash. He possesses a belief that his own talent, even if it is diverted to a project for only about five minutes. He has a heft, healthy disrespect for the pretentiousness and conventional wisdom of fashion, which is true, which is probably something that comes from a lot of pain in it if you've been interning at Fendi and you felt as if like you guys weren't getting respected or you felt as if the fashion industry was you know telling you that you weren't good enough when you do get in you're not going to then just suddenly you know uh bow down and start you know curtailing and obey what they're saying you're gonna you're gonna kick up some fuss remember you're gonna kick some shit down in it and be a bit of a nuisance anyway uh like Lagerfeld Mr. Abloh has made his mark in part by embracing irony like Lagerfeld he has made a community uh, that can seem like a cult of personality around himself. Like Mr. Lagerfeld, he speaks in rolling sentences and it's a pleasure to listen to, especially in a world where the most celebrity names, celebrity names, sorry, often seem try often seem to be tying themselves in knots as a process of answering a question, right? Uh, we look at you, Hadis Samain. Uh, Mr. Lagerfeld blithely sprinkled these conversations with erudite references, as does Mr. Ablo, though this. Uh, his tend to be references of popular intellectuals, uh, Miles Van Der Rohe, Duchamp, Rem Koolhaas, you know those names already. It's funny they had the same way of doing the name drop, isn't it? Like, Kanye does that too, isn't it? These rolling names, so like, they, they form like, it's like, you know, Miles Van Der Rohe, du 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 Dusha, Rem Koolhaas, it's like a, it's like a little, it's like a mantra. While Lagerfeld were often obscure and extraordinary, 
the data illustrator, illustrator Kyle Nielsen in his 1914 children's book, East Sun of the West of the Moon. In the realm of the self-branding, Mr. Lagerford has a signature look, a uh, powdered white ponytail, high collar. Mr. Abloh has a signature logo, the question mark. Mr. Abloh legitimizes his criticize. Oh, no, Abloh has that legitimate look. He has that thing in it. He has that walk. Like, he walks like Ian Connor. They all have that walk, that walk where like, you just let, you let, you just let your body walk you forward. It's very bizarre. Don't they walk the same? Do you think so? Ian Connor and Virgil have the same like weird like walk. <laughs> Miss Ablo was criticised for doing too much. A lot of it not well enough. As is Ablo. So far, Miss Ablo has proved himself best as a designer when building a top of a foundation and establishing someone else. His baton is more interesting in his off-white, which is very true. Off-white is painful at the moment. Man. It's really, really bad. Which often seems like a pallid copy of other people's ideas. Just as Mr. Lagerford Chanel was more effective than his namesake label, which is, yeah, the Carl Lagerford brand was horrendous. Uh, when led to create from scratch, the result of both parts was and has been less convincing. Miss Ablo has been called out for copying. Blah, 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 we know that. Uh, it's a log of her creativity is extraordinary uh, let's go to the bottom I don't want to read the whole thing but anyway so the whole thing is there check it out but then the, the, the sad thing about it was that when, when that article came out we saw his fashion show right and <sighs> Jesus Christ man I don't know, man. Obje again, objectively speaking I don't know what I don't know what you guys think but objectively speaking just like a, someone that likes clothes right it just looks really awful and I, I think for a long time, I thought to myself, you know what, is Virgil doing off-white, like, um, undercover, John Takashi undercover, like, every clip, there's no, like, la there's no, for, for anyway, from the outside looking in, from the un from the uninformed, as my, as I am, J what John Takashi does are undercover, there doesn't seem to be, like, a, a through line from collection to collection, it just seems that one collection is about some, telling one story, then it moves on to a completely different thing, there's nothing that ties it together, you know, like a, you know, like a Rick, or like a Saint Laurent, or like a Celine from back in the day, where like you know there was, there was some kind of theme that tied it together, right? An evolution. It just seems as if like every season he just has a new idea and just blurts it out and tries to extend it across like you know forty plus looks. And yeah, look number one, like the article I mentioned, just like you know you got one of the hottest models in the world wearing your outfit. It just looks like it looks horrendous. Like you just cover the all up in these ruffles and nothing. F it, it you know it looks like the stuff that he designs. What's that thing? Uh, Project Runway stuff like all right it's designed but phew, wow man like none of that stuff fits well none of it nothing fits well look at it but again the only good thing the, the, the good thing i'd say about virgin is that the girls here generally look like they're having fun like he creates a good show it's fun it's cool those models that usually have to go to like you know really drab and dreary uh dress rehearsals or fittings and have to be touched up and objectified and insulted by these really uppity up their own ass fashion designers then you got someone like virtue who's like dapping you up hugging you talking to you about some thing you saw in the shade room playing the coolest hip-hop music smoking weed you know what i mean i think it's that that's the cool thing about it i think it's changed what is expected of a fashion designer but just as when it comes to just plain old clothes i think that Vanessa Friedman like Again, where this looks like something he just jacked off, like Jonathan Sanders or you know Luebe or something, right? Or like, like where does that link? Where does that? Where does look number five with this overcoat and this amazing bag and a leather trousers and the sandals and that little necklace? Where does that link to like one with the opening look? Where, where's the link to that? There's nothing that like you wouldn't even think that's. You know, it looks like it looks like a those student shows where every, like every fourth look, like it's like four looks is per person. It's just, yeah, it's just bizarre, man. It's honestly bizarre. And I, and I think this is his cheat code when he doesn't know what to do. He has these, like, long, these knit, where these knit tops with, like, long sleeves and he just puts a pattern on it, which is, you know, this is a cool cheat code, but you can see it from a mind off. But yeah, the stuff he does clothes wise is just, I don't know, man. Again, the best stuff he's done so far has been with Louis Vuitton, obviously, and obviously with Nike. When he's already got something to build upon, like, you know, his collaboration shoes wise, you can't deny everything's been a win. Even these Jordan 5s that are coming out, suddenly he's made people want Jordan 5s again. Like, it's fucking insane, right? So the guy is a fucking talent and a fucking freak in that way, but everything else? It's hard, man. It's tough. Like this, that not, none of this makes sense. Like it's just like suddenly you got this amazing dress there. Suddenly out of nowhere, of all the crap you got this, but then is it the model making it look amazing or it's just I don't know. But yeah, interesting article none, nonetheless. Definitely recommend you check it out. Uh, is Virgil Abloh the millennial version of what is it? What was it? What's the actual title of it say? Is Virgil Abloh the car lover for millennials? Check it out on New York Times available right now. Anyway, it's now an hour. 
I'm gonna head off and party and do my damn thing, play a bit of music, DJ for some people and stuff. As per usual, if you're watching this via YouTube and you like what you're hearing, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app and you hear my voice here nice and deep, nice and deep via the podcast app, leave a five star review, share with your friends, and I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Until then, take care, be safe, and bye, you filthy mother.